Good evening and welcome to the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. We have a few special guests tonight and they will be discussing the Dutch Golden Age Prince by Rembrandt and his contemporaries. We are recording this uh, program tonight, so you'll notice that it is a webinar format. So if you see down at the bottom, there's a little section that is chat or question and answer. If you have something you want to ask the panelists or if there's something that you'd like to uh, comment on, feel free to go ahead and say what you'd like there. And hopefully we can get a chance to integrate your questions and ideas into the conversation. And I'd like to say hello to Sarah Hall, Director at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. And thanks for being with us for tonight's uh, Let's Talk Art, a Zoom salon. Um, we've been calling it a Zoom salon. Um, or I've been calling it a Zoom salon anyway, <laughs> because a salon, and this is where Wikipedia can come in very handy, a salon is, according to Wikipedia, a gathering of people held by an inspiring host. During the gathering, they amuse one another and increase their knowledge through conversation. So I won't claim to be an inspiring host, but I think amongst um, the six of us on here, um, hopefully we can be inspiring hosts together. Um, and I hope we all amuse each other and uh, increase our knowledge. And I think as Kelly mentioned, this is meant to be conversational. So we may interrupt each other. It's hard on Zoom um, with lags in, uh, with the sort of audio and things like that to always be really elegant about when you insert yourself into conversation. So um, be patient with us, um, share your questions as Kelly recommended, and hopefully we'll, we'll all have a good time. Um, and Daniel and I have um, Kelly, who welcomes you here with us tonight. She is the museum's educational engagement coordinator. And uh, Kelly may pop in with some tidbits in the conversation as well, because she is a practicing studio artist and educator. So she might have some um, really good insights to share with us as well. If you've been following along with our Let's Talk Art programs, this is the third one that we have planned to enhance the experience of our current exhibition, The Dutch Golden Age, Prints by Rembrandt and His Contemporaries. And by the way, that closes Sunday the 24th. So if you haven't seen it, come on in. Um, and take a look at the, the um, exhibition. Tonight's program is really meant to highlight for you a new program that we began with this exhibition called Visiting Voices. So um, Visiting Voices is um, a, a, a concept where we invite people from the larger museum community to write labels for the exhibition and they're additional labels. So you get a regular museum label next to the work of art and then you get a visiting voices label. And the idea with the visiting voices label is that the writer has a unique perspective and the label that they write should feel a little bit more like something written by a smart friend of yours, or if you were walking through the exhibition with a smart friend whispering things to you, um, giving you a richer experience of the show. Um, so as opposed to the sort of um, who wrote that museum label, I'm, I'm reading this authoritative label and I don't know who wrote that. Um, so the visiting voices labels are a different kind of concept. And we had seven different visiting voices label writers and tonight three of them were able to join us. And I do want to recognize um, all seven of those, but first I'm going to list the four who aren't with us. And if they are friends of yours, make sure you get to the museum and uh, read their labels if you haven't. And um, then I will give a little introduction to the three um, writers who are with us. So we had labels written by David Bettini, um, Melinda Marsden, Susan Parker, uh, Francisco Quintanilla, and tonight with us, um, we have Claudia Giannini um, and you'll hear from Claudia. She received her MFA from West Virginia University with a specialization in printmaking and photography. She's exhibited her work throughout the US. She also has a master's in education in museum education. And um, she has worked in the museum field as an educator, curator, and grant writer for close to 40 years. Um, we have overlapped some in our museum careers. And uh, the other um, 
one of the other label lists we have with us tonight is Jamie Gruska, and I will admit, um, full disclosure, he is my husband who, when I met him, was teaching Intaglio printmaking. So he's the first person I thought of when, um, when in fact, he did invite me to see his etchings. If you've ever heard that expression, um, when I met him, he invited me to see his etchings. Um, Jamie works with photography, painting, and Intaglio printmaking. He is currently the administrator for the photography program at Carnegie Mellon University, where he also teaches. And um, we also have with us tonight uh, Audrey Scanlon Teller, who um, is a great friend of the museum as well. She's an art historian and an artist who uh, lived and studied in Ireland for several years and wrote her doctoral dissertation on 12th century Irish history and high cross monuments. Um, she has been a volunteer and a part-time staff member at the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts since 2011. So I'm really had to ha happy to have this group here tonight. I hope that we will um, learn and what was it, please and uh, be pleased and educated together in our conversation. So I'm gonna hand it off to Daniel now and he's gonna give a quick overview of the exhibition and then hopefully we'll get into conversation. Thank you very much, Sarah. And thank you everybody for joining us tonight. I'm going to share my screen with you and we're gonna have a look at some of the prints in this show. So welcome to Let's Talk Art. And this exhibition is called The Dutch Golden Age, Prints by Rembrandt and His Contemporaries. And what the exhibition tries to do is to show the influence of one of the most famous artists in the history of art on artists both within his time, and we're talking about the 17th century here, but also coming down into the 18th and the 19th centuries, as you're gonna see. The exhibition is organized and circulated by the Reading Public Museum in Pennsylvania. And it has about 60 some odd prints total. The geographic location we're gonna be looking at is here in the Low Countries or the Netherlands. At the time in the 17th century, it was referred to as the Dutch Republic. Specifically, we're looking at Leiden and Amsterdam uh, tonight. We call it the Dutch Golden Age for a couple of different reasons. This was a period in which the arts flourished in this Dutch Republic. You have a new middle class that begins to collect the art. You have the emergence of an art market where people and part of this middle class known as burgers wanted to buy art. They wanted to display it in their homes or keep it for private viewing. It was a period of, of considerable mercantile activity in which um, the Dutch Republic expands overseas. It also grows at home from within. People are becoming increasingly prosperous and they're very interested to uh, celebrate their pride, both in their culture, their religion, and in their economic and overseas expansion in many different ways. And there are a variety of subjects that you're gonna see tonight. Some of the works are religious in nature, so they're historical subjects, biblical, while others show depictions of everyday life. And one of the most amazing things about Rembrandt and his contemporaries is their ability to capture uh, scenes of everyday life to freeze a moment in time and to take us really into this particular focused uh, image of an individual, of a landscape, uh, of a scene from the Bible, for example, in which we are just pulled right into it. There's a tremendous immediacy. To it. And you'll also see the names of other different artists besides Rembrandt. Here are just some of them listed below. And I should also mention that Rembrandt and his contemporaries worked during the age of the Baroque. That is, a period of art in the 17th century, it's often characterized by dramatic and emotional subjects. And Rembrandt is a very fascinating figure indeed, as I mentioned. He's not only a painter, he's also a printmaker, he's a collector, and sometimes art dealer. These are a couple of different images of him etching on the left from early on in his career. A very lovely self-portrait of him in the Bureau Collection in Scotland, and then on the right, a copy of that image that's in the collection of the Washington County Museum of Fine Arts. Here's a portrait of him from late in life where he becomes a bit more brooding. He's fallen upon several different hardships that afflict him. Rembrandt went through a lot of difficulties in his life. And um, by the time he gets to the 1660s, some of his works get more dark in nature, he continues to become more introspective to turn inward. And some of his works such as these, these are not in the exhibition, but I just show you the tremendous um, sense that he had in terms of capturing the depth of emotion. I think this will come up tonight, his use of contrast between light and dark, typically known as chiaroscopy plates. 
as well as the printing press. And he would often do these in different states. And that's something that we'll discuss more tonight, achieving these fabulous effects. Here are a couple of highlights from the exhibition. This is one called Dr. Faustus, which is a kind of a mysterious subject, loosely literary, perhaps theatrical. And you can see how he does these con the contrasts of the light and dark. They're just stunning, they're striking. Or Christ driving the money changers from the temple, a bit earlier from 1635. One of my favorites is the Annunciation to the Shepherds from 1632, in which he takes this typical biblical scene, but he casts it within what appears to be a 17th century Netherlandish landscape. And you can see that it is really a tour de force as a print. We also have some that are very emotional, such as the stoning of St. Stephen from 1635 as well. And from there, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie, and he's going to tell you a little bit about his insights about this print and others. Thank you, uh, Daniel. I, I, I guess uh, as, uh, as as Sarah in, in included in the introduction, I was uh, working in the medium, uh, trying to figure out how to make prints that were good. I guess, and uh, I, I. I think there's a connection. In fact, I was interested to hear that Claudia's background includes photography, uh, because I think there's a certain kind of interest in printmaking to have images that are clear and in some ways uh, powerful. Uh, and photography shares, shares that kind of uh, way of making an image, uh, one that is graphic very often, especially black and white photography, which is a medium that I work in. I, I don't really like color photography very much. And I think there's a connection between the kind of graphic aspects of photography and printmaking. And so that there was a sort of entry point for me in that. And I guess I had a hard time deciding which print to uh, write a label for. Uh, the uh, Dr. Faustus print was very uh, tempting because it, it's such a beautifully graphic, powerful, clear image. Uh, but I, I sort of was remembering a little bit about the connection between Picasso and um, Rembrandt, which is a fairly well-documented one. And uh, I think uh, the, these examples that I gave, I give here side by side show what I was maybe thinking about when I decided to choose the golf player as the print to write about. Uh, that I was really thinking pretty much immediately when seeing this print of some, a number of Picassos I had seen uh, that were connected to uh, thinking about Rembrandt. Uh, or you could say Picasso was, uh, obsessed with Rembrandt, actually. Uh, there were two periods in his life where he was. One was uh, in the 30s uh, when he, um, he, he made a series of uh, prints called the Vollard Suite, uh, which were about 100 plates. And uh, this is one of them from that period. Uh, later on in his life, pretty much well, I'll show, I think D Daniel will maybe move on to the next ones, but uh, this sort of wonderful sense though, the comparing those two of, of how you have an area that's very well developed as an image and one that's very notational, right? And uh, this kind of uh, <laughs> technique that I think uh, uh, Picasso basically stole from Rembrandt. I mean, it's a, it's a method of, of trying to understand uh, how you could develop a dramatic space, not just in terms of uh, tonality or light or chiaroscura really, but also in a, just a, a plainly graphic sense. These are interesting pictures in that uh, the, the, the face you see right there above the two women on the one on the screen now is Rembrandt. And uh, these, there's a, quite a number of prints that uh, Picasso talks about uh, having Rembrandt sort of enter the picture. Uh, there's a quote I have here for you. I'll, I'll just read it quickly. That uh, in, This is in 1934. He says, I uh, imagine I made a portrait of Rembrandt. 
it was it was another case of the cracking varnish. I had an accident with the plate and said to myself, it's ruined, so I'll do any old thing on it. I began to scribble. Of course, you know, Picasso's scribbling is kind of a funny idea, right? And it turned into a Rem, into Rembrandt. I liked it so I continued. I even made a second with his turban, his fur, and his eyes as elephant eyes, you know them. And uh, now I'm working this plate further to get blacks just like his. Of course, you know, Picasso's competitive. I'm going to interrupt you. So for every every etcher, is Rembrandt standing over his shoulder? Well, uh, well, it seems. I mean, uh, Daniel, uh, share the one on the other side, on the left, and you'll see also uh, there, that's clearly Rembrandt right there. I mean, you know, he's... He sort of has internalized Rembrandt uh, in in his etching. He, you could say that he was the only person probably he was thinking about, besides himself, of course, uh, when he's making his etchings. He's he's really wanting to be as good an etcher as Rembrandt, and then surpass him. And uh, as if Daniel, if you move to the next slide, you'll see that. Uh, well, yes, yeah, so this is an example from 1970. Now, you know, at, at that point, if, if you do the math, uh, Picasso is about uh, in his uh, late 80s, right? And he's, uh, he's just producing this uh, astounding amount of prints. In seven months, uh, in 1968, he made 350 plates. There's this sort of clear, uh, way that he's trying to really cement his superiority in a way over Rembrandt uh, in the medium just by sheer uh, brutal <laughs> number of prints that he's producing on a daily basis. Uh, this one, of course, is uh, based on uh, a possibly a Rembrandt's, certainly Rembrandt's largest etching and possibly his most accomplished one that you see here on the right. Uh, Ete Homo, uh, state two is here. Uh, there were, I think, a total of eight states, if I believe, of this print uh, that uh, some people feel is uh, the most uh, articulated one of, of Rembrandt's career. As you can see, the, in this particular state, and Daniel, if you sort of zoom or go down to this one below, a later state, which you see that whole crowd in the foreground is gone. It's been erased uh, by Rembrandt to presumably make more powerful uh, composition, maybe one that uh, emphasizes Christ in the center of the uh, plate. Uh, but uh, there's, this, there's this wonderful uh, sort of sense that uh, through this, and you know, uh, if, if I guess if we move on to even the next slide, Daniel, that you might, I think the next one has uh, one of my prints on the far right, but the bottom, <laughs> kind of nice to put my print next to Picasso. It's a little trick, trick of this. But uh, you know that this is an example where you could see I'm trying to figure out how to make images that are simple, direct, searing, clear, uh, oh. The ones that I always thought that, uh, of course, in the idiom of abstraction, uh, because that's, you know, that's what interested me back when I was making this print. And it still does, but uh, I, I, guess, I guess the point is that uh, this is, of course, an aqua tint. It's, it's a technique that comes after uh, Rembrandt, uh, and we could talk more about that later if need be. But uh, there's a... And if you zoom out again, Daniel, a little, or go above, you'll see that there's a, a couple, you know, there's a connection of this wonderful freedom that Picasso uh, exhibits in, say, this uh, print, which is from 1968, and this outpouring of prints from this period of the 347 etchings done in seven months. Uh, and it's a sugar lift which is a technique that uh, Rembrandt was not aware of because it didn't exist yet, I guess. Uh, but I, I guess this sense that 
images could be made more freely uh, is what a, what brought me to uh, love etching uh, and still have this kind of autographic quality uh, that drawings had, but also had a, another, another aspect that was sort of similar to the power of photography. Um, this, uh, I guess the, only, the last image I haven't talked about is this one, which is an unfinished print but uh, it's been theorized that it is one that uh, Rembrandt used as a teaching tool uh, to sort of um, isolate different techniques that he would show his students uh, about the printing, uh, the etch intaglio process. Uh, this has been disputed. Some people think that really all that happened was Rembrandt never finished it. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of buy that it's, it's a so, teaching tool. So what's Picasso doing with this? This is a famous print of Rembrandt's with a mysterious, you know, inexplicable story. So what's Picasso doing with it? Well, it turns out that this, this particular print became sort of an obsession uh, of Picasso's. And in fact, uh, from what I understand back uh, in, in the... Uh, late 60s, of all things, Picasso uh, discovered, uh, rediscovered Rembrandt in a way that he actually, and this was after following a, a, an operation. So he was, he was a little less able to paint. So it, it sort of connected to him reading uh, a newly published uh, volume of a catalog of Rembrandt's complete uh, drawings and paintings. Or, or print, and uh, he actually projected uh, Rembrandt's Night Watch from 1642, the famous painting, against a wall in his studio, and at, to the point that these figures were life size. I mean, it's kind of a dramatic thing to do, uh, as a way to somehow immerse himself in the kind of world of. Um, of of Rembrandt, and in fact, he, uh, he there's quite a few paintings of uh, of the um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the uh, the folks with the plumes, the hats. Uh, somebody remember the word for me? I'm all of a sudden forgetting. Um, hmm. I, you're thinking of the 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 fellows in the Night Watch. I'm not. Yeah, well, there's a yeah, the, there's a name for those guys, <laughs> uh, but uh, he, he's uh, that is somebody needs to, Daniel, you know, don't you? Yeah, they're they're members of the militia company. But there's a generic term for these fellows. Um, yes, but I'm not I'm not uh, slipping my mind. Um, regardless, I I mean the, the 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 yeah, there's an example in this one of that. Uh, that type of, uh, of character, but uh, it came from the time of Rembrandt. And it was, it was obviously, a, you know, the, at this point in Picasso's life, there's certainly a lot of images of, of uh, sort of almost actually pornographic imagery uh, because uh, there's a lot of theories about Picasso near the end of his life really pretty unhappy about that situation, right? So he's, uh, he's trying to sort of pull back a lot of his memories of, uh, of his earlier years when he was more vital. And uh, that seems to include a lot of sex and women, uh, which is uh, kind of a, an interesting uh, reaction to that. But I, um, I think that for me, just to sort of sum up this sort of connection between Rembrandt and Picasso is that I personally found Picasso more accessible uh, to, at the time, probably because of his forays into abstraction. And uh, whereas certainly uh, Rembrandt was so direct that it sort of invited uh, abstraction into the the world of printmaking in a way that other printmakers had not done so. So uh, in in a way, the 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 way that Rembrandt was an inspiration for Picasso makes complete sense, especially in the realm of printmaking, um, certainly in painting as well, but especially printmaking. And I I've come to appreciate Rembrandt more via Picasso 
uh, which is kind of some uh, kind of interesting um, way of doing so. So that's, I think, all my, you know, I, I would here. say before we go on to the next group of slides, I'm wondering if Claudia or Audrey or Daniel or Kelly have anything they want to say about any of the last few things we've looked at, this Picasso Rembrandt. I actually would like to ask Jamie how he did his 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 etching. Oh, uh, my etching. Yeah, your uh, etching. Very large. My, well, uh, sure, uh, sure, Claudia. I, I mean, this was it's a fairly big etching, and at at the time, uh, what I was interested in is trying to figure out a way I can make an etching that was made as the paintings were made that I was trying to do at the time, and so this was a pretty cumbersome big plate. And uh, it was basically made uh, by uh, creating largely for this plate an aqua tint that covered the whole surface of the plate, a deep, rich black. Uh, and that's sort of like a faux meso tint technique, which I, I'm, I don't know if anybody would want to talk about sort of the, what that is. But this one, this meso tint was made with spray paint, right? So. Um, I covered the whole plate and etched it, and it was a comp almost a black plate when I inked it. And then I did the actual, the black marks with a brush, and then I submerged the whole thing in a very strong nitric acid. This is a zinc plate. And it pretty much dissolved or leveled all of the, all of the texture of the plate that held the ink, except for the black marks that we see now. So I, you know, it's dramatic, a lot of bubbling and a lot of heat and, you know, very, very exciting process, if I, if I recall, for making this one. And uh, that, maybe some of that drama is part of the excitement for the uh, process for well, me. How big is this? It's pretty big. Obviously, I've lived with this print for a while. A large. Yeah, we actually have it hanging on the wall over there, yeah. How big is it? Oh, it's well, I actually have the size there, right, Daniel? A little back, if you zoom out a little, I think it's like 27 by 22, which is a pretty big metal plate to be working with. Uh, you know, it's heavy. And, you know, you have to have big trays of acid. It's, it's kind of a, it's a real process. Uh, I don't think Rembrandt had the need for this kind of pyrotechnics in his work, sort of a little bit of a, you know, compens overcompensation on my part, uh, a bigger plate, less talent, you know, whatever. I, I, I think that, that the, um, the, it was, the reason it's hanging in our house is, is I feel at the time certainly it was one of my more successful works because it, it had the kind of clarity that I was searching for in an image. Uh, that was um, actually not so easy to get in etching, um, at least for me. I, I mean, etching is usually a smaller scale process. And uh, to make something this big that was successful was, you know, I, I was happy with it. Um, I had a lot of failures for sure. So I will, I was going to say, I'll define a mesotint really quickly and then we can see what the next slide is. Mesotint was really popular in the 18th century as a way of reproducing paintings because of the fact that it got really subtle painterly variations in tone and it is re it's incredibly laborious. And I worked in my prior job with an artist, Craig McPherson, who is known to have rocked the largest mesotint plate <laughs> that is documented. And what you do is you take your plate and you, you use a tool and you do what they call rocking the plate, which kicks up burrs all over the surface of the plate. So finally you end up with a plate that's covered with little metal burrs. So if you inked it, it would print completely black, but it is a gorgeous, really rich velvety black. And so the artist works backwards from other printmaking techniques in that they flatten the areas of the, of the image rather than um, incising them um, kind of thing. It goes from dark to light rather than light to dark, I guess is the... Okay. And in my case, I, I was just uh, extremely lazy, right? I just, I just use acid to remove all of that texture, which, you know, it's uh, a mesotentist would just completely dismiss all of that. But uh, at the time, it seemed like a good way to do it. You know? So 
There's actually a question on here. Uh, what was Picasso's interest in Rembrandt limited to, to just printmaking? Well, no, uh, he, it wasn't. Uh, I, I think in some ways the, you know, the, the sort of world, uh, Picasso got kind of pulled into the time. Uh, I mean, I, I found this great quote that uh, this wonderful, that this is what someone found compelling was this dialogue between uh, Rembrandt's deeply humane sanity and Picasso's Dionysian madness. I mean, there's there's this there is this sort of uh, wonderful contrast between the two of them if, if they're seen together. Uh, but I, I guess in I guess in a way uh, the the fact that Picasso became so interested in this sort of world of you know beards and swords and curly hair and all this sort of uh, stuff that was a, a part of uh, the world of, of, of Rembrandt's time. Uh, I, I think that sort of allowed him to enter. Uh, and there's, there's a number of paintings uh, of Picasso's that I think also uh, address this. But, you know, in some ways, I don't know if Picasso really found uh, Rembrandt's paintings as inspirational as his printmaking. Uh, I, I, I don't, you know, somebody could argue with that, I'm sure, but I, I really see there's a very direct connection to the etching process, but for Picasso, but not, um, not really. There were so many other painters that I think uh, Picasso found more compelling. And so you were mentioning the, the humanity of Rembrandt, which is, I think, what we're going to see um, coming up. OK. And this is the print that Claudia, you, did, you, did you choose to write about this one? This yes, I did. Yes. Um, and for that exact reason, because, um, I, well, when I think of Rembrandt and his paintings and his prints, all of his prints and all of his paintings. Um, I think of him uh, for the humanity in his work that he kind of saw um, maybe, or maybe to put it another way, a spark of divine in everyone. And this, um, this print is really tiny. It's, um, they don't have a size here, but it's maybe what about, um, four or five inches high and two and a half inches wide. It's not very big. And it's um, possibly cut out of a larger sheet. Um, so another thing I really loved about this is it looks like Rembrandt just sketched right onto the plate. Um, maybe uh, the way, I don't know if people understand the way etchings are made, but in Rembrandt's time, he would have used a copper plate and our time to use zinc plates um, because they're mainly cheaper than copper. Um, and um, the plate is covered in Rembrandt's time with a waxy substance. And in our time, we used asphaltum, which is a substance that's kind of a, um, a oil derivative. And um, um, so you scratch into it with a needle and then you um, lay it in nitric or in acid and the acid only etches into the area where you have um, scratched through with the needle. And um, so it gives you these beautiful lines. And in uh, the time of Rembrandt, a lot of these etchings look very kind of labored or um, not very fresh, but in, but Rembrandt's work always just looks like it, um, I, I don't know, you just kind of, it's like as fresh as a, and personal as a signature in a sense. Um, and that's what I really, really love about his work, even something so tiny as this. Um, so that's kind of why I picked this. So this has me wondering, and sorry, I'm going to go completely off off um, center here with this. But you said fresh as a signature, um, and Jamie used the word autographic to describe printmaking. 
which has me thinking, you know, I think a lot at a certain point, you know, the engraving process prior to etching was really used as a reproductive method, a method, method of reproducing images. So I'm wondering if, you know, this approach to etching um, that differs from engraving that's creating these sort of more, more immediate, more autographic images, you know, it, is that a shift right at this point in our history? Is this what, I, I'm thinking of Jacques Callot maybe before, before Rembrandt, this like starting to identify printmakers as artists, you know, that you can be an artist and your major accomplishment can be printmaking. And, um, you know, maybe our PhDs here have something to add. <laughs> that, I would just like actually to say that Kahlo also did a series of beggars. I love them. Um, there's a Rembrandt did an etching that's similar to this. I probably should have sent it to um, Daniel um, of a full figure, and it's it's a beggar, and I think it's the same figure actually, because um, he has that goofy hat like that. <laughs> um, and uh, so I mean, I, and a lot of people say that. Uh, Rembrandt was inspired by Collot to do to do the beggars, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I, I love uh, I love Callot's work, and his beggars are really. Um... But another thing is that yes, you're right. I mean, uh, engraving was really primarily a reproductive process. I think because you're only scratching through wax, it's very easy. Like you can be sketchy, and you can. Um, you're using a needle to just scratch through wax. It's very easy, whereas engraving is hard to do. If you've ever done it, it's like you're pressing really hard and, um, and you can't, you have to be very careful with the line. Um, etching, because you've etched the line and these lines are very delicate, um, they're easy to you use a tool to kind of just scrape it and you can erase it. That's, um, you know, Rembrandt did that all the time. He erased and that, not, not only that, uh, which I, those of you who have etched know that part of it is that you, you simply, as you pointed out, need to penetrate through the waxy or asphalt and coating to the metal. But then you have a whole nother level of control after that's done by how you etch particular areas. In other words, you'll etch them for a longer period of time to make them deeper, hold more ink, be darker. So you can you can sort of, it, it gives you actually more control in some ways than just a drawing because you're able to do that. And of course, then as Rembrandt made famous, uh, the, the plate tone, the way the plate was printed also could be modified so that you could you could create effects that would happen at the press, not only connected to the original drawings. Uh, so yeah, I mean, this is these are the kind of wonderful aspects of the etching process that I don't think uh, engraving enjoyed in any way, right? Okay, oh, so... Um, this is my work. It's uh, probably um, the last etchings that I did, and that's in 2003. Um, I was really fortunate enough, I had an uh, artist residency at Artist Image Resource, which is a professional printmaking student in a studio in Pittsburgh, and it funded by the Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation. So I made um, these prints um, working with uh, kind of based on um, actually 18th century botanic um, engravings or prints. And um, these are plants that are native to West Virginia where I live. And, mm. but I also kind of um, use them as like, uh, was writing about their medicinal qualities. So this print is about, it's 30 inches by high by 22 inches, a full sheet of paper. It's handmade paper and it has straw in it. Um, and um, that's, and they silk screen. I actually did not do the silk screening. It's, the text is silk screen on the background. And the um, etching is the color 
footprint of the plant. And I did kind of similar to what Jamie did. I did a deep, what's called a deep bite where you lay your plate in and it kind of eats away the background. Like I coated the leaves with asphaltum so they wouldn't be bitten away. And the background is, you know, really bitten down. Um, and that leaves a very um, kind of dark line around the edges, which I really liked. So there's a lot of processes. Um, these were run through the press three times with three different colors, uh, but it's one plate. I also wanted to just, I wanted to show these because something about Rembrandt that was really interesting and really influenced people, including me, um, all the way through was that because he lived in Holland, he had access to Japanese paper. And um, Japanese paper is made from the mulberry tree and it's very absorbent of both paint and ink. And my etchings are printed on Japanese paper. And Rembrandt um, really liked to use Japanese paper for the same reason, it just, <laughs> soaks up the ink like automatically. It's just such a great surface. Um, and he was one of the few, um, because he lived in Holland, um, one of the few people that have such access to Japanese prints, uh, I mean paper. As you might know, Holland was the only country allowed to trade with Japan until Admiral Perry from the United States opened up Japan in the 1860s. So um, really the Dutch had a monopoly on this. Um, so the process became very popular with the impressionist artists like Degas, uh, Mary Cassatt, who also did etching and printmaking and were very influenced by Rembrandt. And they called the process Chine Collé, which means Chinese collage um, actually, they were using Japanese paper and they were, um, you print on, you print the etching on the um, Japanese paper and then you collage it onto a, another sheet, a heavier sheet of paper. And um, that's what I did here. <clears throat> so you mentioned three times going through the press for the prior print because of color. And I'm just wondering if you could go into, since we haven't looked at any color prints until yours came up, a little bit of that. I know, you know, registration is a big part of doing, of, of, of doing, running a plate through multiple times. So maybe you could tell folks listening a little bit about that process. Well, actually, so um, some, in some printmaking processes, people use, they would use a different plate for every color. Um, I didn't do that that way. I kind of invented my own little thing. I used one plate. So the first time I just used the plate um, um, just with no biting, no nothing. I just rolled that yellow on it. Just rolled it so it was just a flat color of yellow. Also my paper was exactly the size of the plate. So I just could lay it on top. I just registered it like it was always the same size. So I didn't have to use elaborate registration processes, which can get pretty complicated. Um, so then I, um, the darker reddish color is um, wiped, it's etched into those leaves and it's wiped into the plate. And then, and I used actually a, um, I used a, an ink that's used in, I can't remember the name of it, that's used in lithography, but it puddles in funny ways. And that's actually what I use to bite those textures, both in the background and in the, on the leaves. So when you do an etching, you kind of push the ink into all those little lines and, um, and then wipe the surface. So your whiter areas are, are lighter and the ink catches in those little, little nooks and crannies really. And then um, on this one, the green leaves are, are 
I used a little roller and I rolled that color onto the green leaves. Ooh. So I kind of made it up as I went along. It's not very, that's not a very standard way of printing, but I did do, there's, these were done in addition. So there's an addition, there, it's a suite of four prints and there's eight prints of each one. Hmm. Now I did it as a residency, so I had help, which was really great. I, I have a question, Claudia. The, uh, the way that the image of the uh, plants were etched into the play, was that, was that through soft ground? Or? No, um, actually it was using that, um, all the texture you see is um, using that, uh, the texture is by using that um, lithographic ink, which is actually oily. So it does provide some kind of a resist. But also then uh, where um, the, how the, the plant itself um, kind of is raised up a little bit, I used asphaltum to protect it. The, the, the leaves and the stems and that gotcha. part. Hmm. I'm still not understanding, but uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like I did this in 2003 and I. Right. I it's, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, your memory. <laughs> I, I had trouble keeping track of this stuff, what I was doing at, at the time. Yeah, it's, they, they're fairly, they, they require a lot of actual discipline and being somewhat methodical, which. Uh, I think this is part of the reason that uh, is someone like Picasso, he didn't print his own prints. Right. You know, he made the plates, but he had, uh, he had printmakers who wanted to work with him badly. And uh, he didn't want to have to spend his time and energy figuring out how to print them. You know, and I, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard work. You know. Well, I, so like I said, I did not do the silkscreen on this. I'm not a silkscreen artist, but I really wanted text. And that's a kind of important thing to me. And um, so um, the artist or the director, Bob Beckman, um, he did the silkscreen mm -hmm. um, on this. And I wanted to talk about that because in Rembrandt's time, Rembrandt, I mean, a lot of these printmakers would, um, have their works printed by a professional printer. Um, but it seems to me, um, I was researching this, I couldn't find it definitively written anywhere, but it seems to me that Rembrandt printed a lot of his own etchings. What do you, Daniel, what's your, do you, um, what do you think about that? Yes, I think that um, perhaps earlier in his career, he may have had, um, may have sent them to a printer but as time went on, he fell in financial hard times. I'm sure he had assistants who helped him, right. particularly when you get on the later uh, etchings. He was doing a lot of that himself because he really was um, living hand to mouth. He was in great debt. Well, and the press was right in his house. So even yes. if somebody was there helping, you know, it was his operation. Um, right. And he also, I mean, he would um wipe the ink in a kind of painterly way and so he had to have done it you know it was very hands-on very very experimental and and i think that's what makes those prints so beautiful actually there is a question here um it goes back to some images we were just looking at uh, was Rembrandt's interest in beggars and peasants intended to shift some focus away from those enjoying the Dutch golden age time of plenty to those less fortunate? What do y'all think about that? I'll say what I think and Daniel can agree or disagree, but I think it's hard to attribute a social consciousness to Rembrandt's beggars in terms of sort of activism, the way we think of it today. I think there's this deep sympathy in humanity and there's an interest in him in recording real people because he's evoking real emotion in his work. And he may use these people, you know, it may be as much about using them as being sympathetic to them, I guess is what I'm saying. But Kello, whose beggars really inspired him, I, I even though he's an earlier artist and um, 
from, you know, it might be harder to argue social consciousness. Callow did do the series, The Miseries of War. So I think with, with that in Callow's column, sort of chalked up to him, we might see those original beggars as having some kind of social, real, real social motivation behind them. I don't know, what, 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 is, what, if, what do you guys think, um, Audrey and Daniel? Well, I think that, I agree with you, sir. I think that he was fascinated by these people. I think he, he recorded them. Uh, perhaps even in some cases, he did the etchings on the spot, almost like a drawing. And I think that, he, that social activism maybe wasn't the first thing that was within his mind. He was, he was just intrigued by their condition. And you can see that here. There's this, it's like the figures are in motion um, in the print. Mm -hmm. This is the one that I chose to write my New Year's message about for that we sent out to um, the museum email list and enlarge the little baby on the mom's back, Daniel, while you have that up, because um, I just think it's talking about economy. <laughs> it, there's like nine lines creating a baby's face on the right behind the mother's head. It's so, and you know, it's just, just there, um, but again, uh, Jamie was talking about notational qualities. You know, you have the pretty well-worked man and then just en enough information. And in some ways, right, that the children and the wife look more alive, um, I think, uh, than the, the male figure does. That gestural quality, that quickness, that freshness. Mm -hmm. Love that print. Okay, where were we? <laughs> Captain William Bailey. So do I need to do anything to speak or can you all hear me? I can hear you, you're, you're Just fine. fine. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, that's, um, I went from my visiting voice, I uh, described uh, tacit and loquitur, uh, which was uh, done by Captain William Bailey who is an Irish artist, um, 18th century artist. And um, he was working with a prince that belonged to an Irish artist friend of his, Nathaniel Hone the Elder, who you can see uh, in the photograph um, under, underneath. Uh, and uh, Nathaniel Hone the Elder uh, was an artist himself. He was a portraitist and a miniaturist. He was born in Dublin. He came from a Dutch family uh, that settled in Dublin. And um, he, he was collected art. He was, because he was, came from a Dutch family and he was very interested in Dutch art, he was collecting Dutch art at the time. And William Bailey uh, presumably met uh, uh, Nathaniel Hone in, in, uh, in, in London, but they may have met in Dublin as well because uh, Captain William Bailey, he was born in, uh, in Kilbride, County Carlow, which was kind of south of Dublin. And then his family, he, he went to school in, in Dublin um, and uh, then was, went to uh, London to study law uh, and uh, but decided that he really wanted to be in the military. So he joined the British Army and he received a commission in the British Army and served with several regiments, uh, the 13th uh, Regiment of Foot. And uh, at the time that he makes uh, Tacit and Loquitur, he is in the 51st Regiment of Foot. Uh, and um, he is working uh, from in the, in the dedication, uh, you can see below, he has this inscription below the uh, below this landscape. And he dedicates this print. He says that it's uh, made from a copy of, of Rembrandt. Um, so, and the print was owned by his friend, uh, Nathaniel Hone. So, and he, and he mentions that within the inscription itself. And it's a, a kind of a dedication to, to his friendship uh, with Nathaniel Hone. And the image itself looks a lot like the landscape where um, William Bailey grew up. 
Uh, it just so happens that land um, at, at the moment, there are 14 acres of land uh, for sale in County Carlow in Sherwood Estates, which is where uh, William Bailey uh, grew up. And it's got a very similar uh, landscape to the uh, landscape that is in Tacit and Loc Locator, uh, where you have rolling hills in the distance and you'll have uh, small uh, fields, uh, sort of almost a, a patchwork quilt of fields uh, below those mountains. And that's very similar to what you see in Rembrandt's etching. I mean, I'm sure the, um, uh, it's, it's, he's replicating a Dutch landscape, but I, I think there's also something in it, something autobiographical uh, in, in the landscape um, in that it does look so much like what would have been familiar to him uh, in Ireland. And the fact that you have two Irish artists, one Irish artist making tribute to another Irish artist and using this landscape, you know, to kind of uh, really, um, kind of embrace their relationship like in, in a formal almost a documented kind of way that you know to to dedicate their friendship uh bailey's friendship to nathaniel hone uh using something that re would might remind them of of home in ireland where they where they both grew up now in in, in the uh in the show we also have work by uh there again, William Bailey, this is another, this is like my favorite print of his. Um, it's the Three Trees and it's made also, it's a copy after a Rembrandt print. Uh, and it, you can see, um, here we have the actual Rembrandt's print side by side with um, William Bailey's work. And you can see that he actually made his print based on a print because it's, re it's reversed um, of, of Rembrandt's actual work. And this again was something that was in uh, Nathaniel Hone's uh, collection that uh, he was able to. So he probably traced the uh, Rembrandt print onto a plate and um, you know, worked it that way, which would account for the fact that the two are like mirror images of, of one another. Um, so, cause if you were to take that image and, and copy it and then draw it, onto a plate, it would be, it would be flipped, it could be flipped. But you can see the differences that Bailey makes um, and, and he's, he's using different, uh, slightly different techniques. He is using some of the mesotint that um, Sarah uh, just had mentioned. Uh, and you can see that he's added the lightning bolts in the sky that Rembrandt sort of has more of a, like a rainstorm. You can see the, the horizontal striations of rain, but there's not the lightning, there's not you know, it's it's sort of a more gentle shower, and uh, William Bailey then just makes this this a dramatic oncoming storm with the darkening, the the rain and the clouds, and then the flash of lightning uh, in the in the background. I've actually been fascinated by this print uh, for years because I've I've never quite understood that this very strong sort of jarring diagonal lines in the in the Rembrandt in the upper left corner. Uh, does somebody have any uh, thoughts on that at all? I, I wondered if, uh, I can't say I've seen anything that talks about that in any particular way. Aren't they peculiar to you? I mean, it, it seems like it, those lines sort of remove themselves from the space of the, of the atmosphere. They, they come forward. You forward know. so much. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just wondering if it's, if it's like one of those showers, you know, where, where you get those sudden summer downpours and, you know, you look across the street and, you know, it's, it's sunny or there's, there's nothing, but you know, over you, it's just absolutely, you know, pouring rain. And so you'll get that isolated cloud uh, that is just sort of floats in and, um, you know, dumps in a, in a very concentrated manner. And that's kind of what it looks like to me. I see it as sheets of rain. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so it's so visceral, like physical in 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 just the imagining of the making of those lines. It's just this very 
very quick and uh, sort of, oh, I don't know, it's, it's not pictorial in a way. It's almost like a physical imagining of, of the space being sort of deluged with water. It's, it's, I, I, always, I always thought it was wonderful, but I, I always wondered about it. it. It's a little out of character with uh, Rembrandt, I thought. And it really pops forward. Yeah. I mean, you know, Rembrandt never had a fear of, of having a directness to the marks, but those are a lot of marks that are direct, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. It, so uh, that's sort of what always uh, I, I found fascinating about them. Yeah. Well, I also really love this print. Well, I like the Rembrandt one. I wasn't familiar with the Captain William Bailey copy, but um, I, I, what always bothered me, or not bothered me, what, what, what always kind of captured my attention were the kind of unconcern of the figures in the foreground, or kind of the mid foreground there, um, the, they're unconcerned with the rain. Because <laughs> it looks like that rain is pouring down. And, mm -hmm. you know, but yeah, I always, um, I, I, I think this is a really kind of interesting piece because of the, figures in the landscape and um, the kind of presence of the landscape. And the it kind of reminds me of a Chinese painting where the figure is so subsumed into the landscape. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And also what's very interesting is Rembrandt becomes an observer of mm -hmm. these atmospheric effects. He's interested in the weather too. And you well, can Roger yeah. Roger Fairborn just had a, a comment on here that uh, it's when she and Rembrandt was an early meteorologist mm -hmm. um, and, and just discussing that the lines are very striking. I actually didn't realize that it was rain until I saw the Bailey with the lightning strikes. So um, I don't know, it's like I got a little hint from uh, the, the, the copy there. He really did change it with the, the storm clouds. That's yes, quite it, different. It's part of the uh, late 18th, early 19th century um, emergence of romanticism in the sublime yes. and yes. awesome nature. Yes. Uh, look at how dangerously close the bolts at least appear to be to the trees. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure Audrey gets to talk about the example of her work that she included here. Yeah, this is uh, a an etching that I did, and it's, this is a very traditional etching. Um, I was uh, my husband had a business trip in Belgium, and we were in Leuven, and there was this wonderful. Um, open aviary uh, space and it was like an eatery and 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 they had all these finches and canaries in this open aviary, aviary space and I just when I was sitting down here and watching the goldfinches I just had this Carol Fabrizius moment I was like oh my god I gotta take this picture this is just amazing I don't know if and I've never said that before <laughs> yes <laughs> I'm having a Carol Fabrizia's moment. <laughs> but, um, and I took a picture of it. And then I was uh, working at um, Northern Virginia Community College. I, as I got my bachelor's degree in, uh, in studio art and I specialized in printmaking, but I, I continued my print practice uh, at, when I was living in Northern Virginia by taking classes at the Northern Virginia Community College and having access to their um, their presses. And so I made this, uh, this what was a photograph into an etching. And I thought it, it was, it called for a very traditional Rembrandt-like 17th century um, etching style. So, I mean, it, it literally is, it's asphaltum. I used an etching needle and uh, the, the dark areas that you see are just, you know, lots of little lines uh, put in, into the plate. And then um, 
the areas that are lighter have have less lines uh, and were uh, you know were um, were left in the acid longer. So. But now I want to make a painting of that because it was just oh it's just the color was just amazing with these these uh these birds the canaries and the goldfinches and things. Well, um, we have gone an hour. I do want to leave a time here if anybody else has any comments. Do you guys um, want to say anything else while you are all together? Um, do we have any other questions that people want to ask while we're together? I'm hearing silence. I'm not sure they come on. Um, well, this was this was fun. Um, I really enjoyed getting a chance to um, share some thoughts about printmaking, its powerfulness, um, uh, graphic quality uh, was one of the big takeaways. I think the notational quality, uh, the unusualness of I think Rembrandt working a plate almost like a sketchbook. Um, his his observations of the world. Um, so it was um, really interesting to share all of those thoughts together. I'm happy to that we had folks joining us. Did we just get a question? Something popped up and um, in just the, to thank you. Okay. Um, so I, I have one last commercial before we say goodnight, which is my usual thing, which is that the museum is launching um, its fundraiser, Amazing Tablescapes, on February 1st. Um, we are, as all nonprofits um, are, have, you know, having challenges trying to raise money in the current environment. And so much of what we do, we're now doing online rather than in person. So um, I would encourage everybody to please um, check out the tablescapes section of our website when it goes live on February 1st. We um, charge a dollar a vote to vote on your favorite table. If you don't know this fundraiser, really wonderful creative designers do um, elaborate thematic table settings this year in their homes. Normally it would be in the museum and people would get to eat around them. Um, but this time in their homes, um, with uh, pretty extensive documentation on our website so that you can take a look and um, vote for your favorite table. And if you're interested in attending our online preview cocktail party, which is January 31st, um, that is um, available for a donation of $100. You do get some goodies with that. Um, and if you're interested, contact us and we will fix you up to um, be part of that party. Um, and if you have topics you think we should cover in future Let's Talk Art conversations, Daniel and I are always happy to take suggestions. Um, next month, uh, we'll see if, if we're up to the task. We said we were gonna do something love themed for Valentine's Day. <laughs> How that takes shape in terms of looking at things in our collection, whether it's love stories or things we love, um, we will figure that out as we get ready. Um, but I hope everybody will join us next month. Um, thanks again for being with us tonight. Thank you so much, Claudia and Jamie and Audrey for um, being part of the conversation and Kelly and Daniel for helping pull all of this together. Um, and uh, for all of us here, here's wishing everyone a happy, healthy 2021.